Welcome to Life Point Pentecostal Church, where Christ is worshiped, the word is preached, and people are loved. We endeavor to be a 21st century apostolic church in principle, practice, and power. We are Christ centered and community minded. Our desire is to connect, motivate, and inspire people to become disciples who make disciples. We desire to see lives transformed by the power of God's Spirit. We know that He heals and delivers, and we believe that everyone has a God-given purpose ready for them if they are only willing to receive it. We are a community of imperfect people serving a perfect and a holy God. Our life point is Jesus. The point of life is Jesus. And we want our lives and our church to point to Him. We're so glad you're here. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Sorry that it's been a bit of a crazy morning, so we're starting a couple minutes late, but welcome to Life Point Pentecostal Church where Christ is worshiped, the word is preached, and people are loved. Can we just give God a hand clap of praise this morning? He's worthy today to be praised. Amen. All right. There's a lot of announcements, so let's just burn through these this morning. Tuesday night, there's prayer here at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. If you haven't been out to prayer, I encourage you to come. It's a powerful time where we seek God's face. And that's the most important thing that as Christians we can do is seek after God. Wednesday night, there is midweek Bible study. Everybody say 7 p.m. as downstairs in the Fellowship Center. Amen. Thursday morning, there is mom to mom Bible study. And that is at 11 a.m. downstairs at the Fellowship Center. Also on Thursday, everybody say Thursday peanut gallery in the back say Thursday. <laughs> Lifeline, amen. Lifeline small group at 6 p.m. downstairs in the Fellowship Center, amen. Uh, cafe is open today. We have lots of goodies. I posted on the LifePoint group. We've got uh, scones, pumpkin scones that Sister Kim made, pumpkin loaf that I made, and we got pumpkin spice lattes, pumpkin steamers, I have to say they're like better than Starbucks, okay? So come on out if you haven't tried a PSL yet this season. Try one of ours. They're so good. All right. Everybody say youth. Where are my youth at, Emma? <laughs> my youth. Um, October 21st, we're going to be kicking back off youth. This is from ages 12 to 36, and that will be at 7 p.m. downstairs. All right. Everybody say young adults. Young Adults Bible Study will be starting back up again. This is from ages 18 to 36, and that will be at 7.30 p.m. at mine and my husband's home. Um, so let us know if you want to get connected to that and come out. All right, don't forget our giving options. We can give online by e-transfer at lpcquinnell at gmail.com, or you can use the Interact at the front. Um, there's lots of options for you to give. Amen. Let's all stand today. If our usher would like to get ready to come, let's pray for the service, let's pray for the offering, and let's just pray that God would have his way, that he be magnified and lifted up this morning, because he's worthy. Jesus, we worship you today, God. We praise you, Lord. We come to gather here today to worship you and you alone, Lord Jesus. And I just pray, God, that you be lifted high in our hearts and our minds with our voices lifted. God, that we would worship you, God, not with part of our hearts, but with our whole hearts. Amen. Jesus, because you're so good, God, I pray that you would bless this service today. Bless all the hearers today, God. And I pray bless the tithe and offering in Jesus' name. Everybody say, Jesus.
blown away. Blown away by his presence. Blown away by the spirit of God moving in this house like leaves blown in the fall. God seems to be in control of this moment right now. God's spirit seems to be moving in a powerful way as the kids go downstairs and kids' life is dismissed to go down. Can we just take a minute in his presence? Can we just stand in his glory and let God fill this house? Blow in this place, God, like you did on the day of Pentecost. Fill all the house where we are gathered, God. For this is your house. This is your time. This is your place to shine and to have your way. Come on, would that be your prayer today? Would you say, God, have your way? Come on, God, have your way in this place. Come on, the winds of change are blowing. Jesus said, the Spirit of God is like the wind that bloweth where it listeth. It bloweth where it wants to. And you can't change that. You can't stop that. And, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in a windstorm and you felt the resistance of the wind. One time I was, I was skiing. I was at Troll Mountain. And I got up the courage to go down the troll face. And it's like straight down. And as I began to muster up the courage at the top of the hill, and I began to go down faster and faster, and I began to snow plow, the wind picked up. And I jumped in the air, and I was suspended by the wind. I can't explain to you what happened in that moment. But I felt as if all of time had stood still. And as I was going down the troll face, I began to jump more and more because I loved the feeling of almost like I was flying. I feel like that this morning in this place. I feel God in this house. He's lifting burdens. He's, he's lifting up the hands of those that have been hurting, those that have been broken. I feel a lifting of burdens. Can we just one more time lift our hands in his presence and allow him to lift those things, to take those things, to remove those things that have been weighing us down. We're not in a hurry this morning, God. We're waiting on you. As your wind, as your spirit blows in this church, we're loving this God moment, God, and we thank you for what you're doing right now now. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank Him. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and give somebody a high five and say, God is here. Come on, turn to your neighbor, turn to the other neighbor and say, God is here. Hallelujah. God is here. You may be seated this morning. I, I feel like going to the Word. How many people want to hear the Word today? Come on. I got I got 25% over here. How many people want to go to the Word this morning? There we go. There's something about having to love God's Word that gets the job done. There's something about hearing the Word of God and not being doers of the Word of God that doesn't get the job done. Because there's a merger of agreement with God's Spirit to allow Him to do what He wants to do in your life. There's a little switch in your heart. And you can turn it off whenever you want to stop feeling God. Many of us are guilty of trembling in God's presence, getting emotional, and flicking the switch. So it only goes so far. So God only touches me so much. I, I don't want to lose control. But there's some people who said, my switch 
is turned on. When I come in the presence of God, I turn it on. When I go to work, I turn it on. When I get up in the morning, I turn it on. When I go to the Word of God, I turn it on because my heart has got to be on to feel God and to to hear God and to know the things of God. And, And some of us have permanently just left that switch on. And I want to encourage you today, if you've never done it before, would you flick the switch today and turn it on and say, Lord, I love you, I love your word, and I love what you're doing in my life, and I'm not going to limit what you want to do with this service and with this message. I feel like some people came into agreement with me today on that because they're not going to push back on what God wants to do this morning. Let's go to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation 21 and 5. I've asked the praise team to to hang out and help a preacher now. I like like there being a little bit of ambience, a little bit of atmosphere as we read the Word of God because it carries the worship service into the Word being preached, and I feel it's so very important. Atmosphere is half the battle. That just flicks the switch. Revelation 21 and 5 says, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Everybody say new. All things new. And he said unto me, speaking of John the Revelator, Write, for these words are true and faithful. True and faithful. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Everybody say new. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. If you have the courage today, Would you come into agreement with me and ask God to make me new? Lord, make me new. I want this to be a new move of God, a a fresh word, God, from heaven. and, And I want it to be new. I want it to not just renew, but to make me brand new, God, to completely radically change me into something I've never been before, to make me new, God. I, I want to feel your powerful change of becoming new. I don't want just what I've always done and what I've always been. I, I want to become a new creature. Uh, I want to become new. Uh, I want, God, if it has to be, there's problems in my life. I want to just stop dealing with the old ones and give me new ones, God. I, I want a new change. Challenge. I want to go forward. I want all things in my life to become new. Somebody say amen. Come on in Jesus' name. Why don't you clap your hands unto the Lord and give him some praise. I want to tell you something new. Do you want to hear something depressing? <laughs> King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, And verse 9 through 11, I'll read it in the New King James Version. He said, that which has been is what will be. And that which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? You see, Solomon is being sarcastic here. He goes on to say something startling. He says it has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Everybody say, that's us. In case that went over your head like it did mine when I first read it, I had to read it twice. He said, we will never comprehend that the past or that history repeats itself either. If you have ever heard that terminology, that history repeats itself, you figure that we would get wise on the on the deal, that if this has all been done before, we should be getting better at this 
thing called life than, than being in the dark or, or misunderstanding what life's all about. And, and I feel like that's what Solomon is talking about. Have you ever heard statements like they don't make them like they used to? Come on, somebody wave your hand if you know that's true. Come on. Come on. It was better before. Or back in my day, followed by a lecture of how future, just the future pales in comparison to the way things used to be. And I know there are some exceptions where we do things smarter now. Like, like I used to play hockey, and when I played hockey, my dad said, if you can't pack your own hockey bag, then you can't play hockey. Well, the bag was bigger than me. And I was five years old, and I had to rubber leg it to the truck, and, and uh, it made my legs stronger, you know. But now they got wheels on the bag. And I said, that's genius. What? Why didn't you? I wasn't allowed to drag my bag. I had to pack it. You see, but even now I can say that when I grew up, I tell my kids, Gen Z was probably the last truly free generation to play in the woods, to use my imagination all day long, to run, to exercise, to climb, and to build forts. Hit my thumb with a hammer. No computers, no cameras, no Netflix, no social media, just beautiful, innocent, dumbfounded boredom. It was amazing. Counting cars on road trips. Punch buggy, no return. Come on, kids, kids, you got to ask your parents about that. If you dared to ask, are we there yet? It was always followed up with sit down and be quiet or I'll stop this car. It was just a better time. And now it's tablets on long trips and hopefully not just scrolling our lives away, it seems. But if the wisest man who ever lived says there's nothing new under the sun, then you can't argue with the man. You can't argue with Solomon. The Bible declares King Solomon was the wisest, most prosperous, and the most powerful man who ever existed in all of human history. He wrote 3,000 proverbs and 1,000 songs. He built the first temple. He had peace with every nation around him. He was a wise judge. He passed the wisdom test of the queen of Sheba. He established trade routes so successful that the Bible says Solomon made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones or pebbles on the road. But falling to not prioritizing, following all of God's commandments, Solomon was led astray to the worship of of idols by his many wives and concubines. So he wasn't that smart after all. Because we know he didn't even follow his own advice when he said in the book of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and obey his commandments. There's something to be said about keeping it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. I, I've heard that before. I don't know if that's still acceptable in 2022. So if the wisest man who ever lived said there's nothing new under the sun and that history repeats itself, that truly all is vanity, that over and over again, no matter what we do, we are all just spinning our wheels, running in a proverbial hamster wheel, going nowhere, getting no wiser or growing no more prosperous than any other people before us. What's the point? What's the answer? What could ever change? What the Bible says can never be changed. Well, maybe we just need a reset. Come on, maybe we just need a fresh start, a new beginning to stop the insanity of doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Okay, church, do you want to hear something else really, really depressing? I don't know why I'm asking. I'm going to tell you anyways. Okay. There's something called the Great Reset. 
supposedly coming down the political pipeline where we will own nothing, but we will all still be happy. That doesn't sound great at all to me. In fact, there's actually nothing great about this great reset. Well, not for us. It's a great big lie, and it's all just going to be a great big mess. The WEF, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset, or the Trudeau Special, as I like to call it, is coming to a Canada near you very soon. Call it a climate crisis, call it a pandemic. I don't care what you call it. It's just the new world order with a pretty red bow on it, and it's being forced upon us as the answer to all the problems that crooked politicians have purposely created to control us indefinitely for all of the foreseeable future. Is it just me, or do you feel like you're being strangled? I feel like I'm suffocating the more of the, the, the woke uh, politics and, and you can't say this and you can't do that. You can't go here and you can't post this or you're going to get booted off of social media and it's pressure, pressure, pressure. Big tech with big censorship. Big pharma for big profits are being weaponized by globalism or big government to roll out a fail-safe, tried, tested, and true method of problem, reaction, solution. Problem, reaction, solution. Create a problem, cause a reaction, offer the solution that benefits your agenda. It's very simple. All tyrannical governments have done this before because it's simple and it works. And it turns out governments have been doing this for eons. It turns out Solomon was right. It's all been done before. And basically, just reset the game every time the people start to figure out that it's all been rigged. Reset the game. When I was 12 years old, I got the original Nintendo. And uh, I used to bite the controller. I'd get so mad. Because I, didn't, I wasn't allowed to throw it. But every time I started losing, i just stand up and reset the game. I would get so mad that I would reset the game and I would start again because, because I, I didn't want to, to lose. And, and, it was, and it was very childish. But that's what people do when they don't get their way. If I don't get my way, then I'm taking my toys and I'm going home. Pastor in a church is a lot like that. People say, I don't like what you're preaching or I'm having a bad day or somebody said something about me and I'm not coming to church for a while because I am upset. And they reset the game. They, they just want to be in control. But listen to this. Thank God we have a solution today. And I'll be preaching on it next week. Just kidding. I won't leave you hanging this morning. Who wants to hear something encouraging today? Come on. I have some good news to preach to somebody today. God has a solution for all this mess, and it's also going to be a great reset. But it's going to be a God reset. Hallelujah. Come on. Yes, there's nothing new under the sun, and that's discouraging, and that's disappointing. But above the sun, S-U-N, come on. Above the sun. Everything is actually under the sun, S-O-N, under the Son of God, under His authority, under His management, under His purview, and under His complete control. Come on, Jesus Christ will foil the plans of the NWO, the end time plans of the enemy or the wiles of the devil. The gates of hell or the strategy of hell, the Bible says, shall not prevail against the church. And yes, the devil will wear out the saints. Yes, he knows his time is short, so he's pulling all the stops. But the devil won't get to pull it all off because my God is still on the throne. Hallelujah. And God's about to upset or overthrow the God of this world. 
Jesus is about to reset the whole world just one more time. He's done it many times before in the Word of God. He hasn't, uh, um, hasn't he done it many times for us in this room? He, he's, he's reset things in our lives so many times. That's what repentance is. You get to start again. You, you know that the mercy is a new mercy every morning. And God can hit the reset button for you and get you on the right track if you've gone astray. But there's, there's seven, seven ways that God reset the world before. And by the promises in his word, he's about to do it again. He's about to make all things new today. Everybody say new. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord for what he's about to do. We worship him by faith in advance for what he's about to do. Because he's about to make all things new. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready for a reset. Come on, get ready for a reset. You see, he makes all things new, the Bible says. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So people think we're weird. Because we become something new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. From the beginning of your walk with God till you walk on the streets of gold, it's a promise from God that from the time he changes your life and those old things begin to pass away until Jesus creates a new heaven and a new earth in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible says, he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all, everybody say all, all, all things new. He's going to deal with wickedness. God's going to deal with the things that gets under your skin, that burr under your saddle. The judgment of God's going to deal with it. He's going to make everything new, and that includes us. How many people know there's some things that God has to change about us? Come on. There's a new mercy every morning. That new mercy every morning gives us a new opportunity to die daily to those old things that are supposed to be passing away in a believer's life. That we should become a new creature in Christ and that's when behold all things are become new or that all things are actually becoming new. It's a process. But that is only if we go with the flow of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. You got to go with the flow. You got to go with the right flow. Because God knows we can't do it on our own and we have to step out of that denial. Or those old things won't pass away. Those old mindsets won't change if we just continue to go with the flow of sin in our lives. If we just keep going along with the flow of what we know doesn't please God. It's getting quiet in here. Woo. Help me, Lord. Come on. So if that's you, I just want to say, hey, it's okay because it turns out you just need a reset today. Come on. There's no perfect people in this church. There's no perfect people in Pentecost. There's only one perfect person, and he died on the cross. He was perfect, and they still crucified him. Come on, you're not just going to tiptoe through the tulips living for God, but you're going to have trials. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have persecution. Come on. You just need a personal home Bible study today to redirect you, to recalibrate you. Maybe you just need a trip up to this altar today at the end of the service. Maybe you just need a touch from God that will reset you and resurrect you. Hallelujah. It's that supernatural touch of God. I could preach bad today and God's still going to show up. Change a few hearts and, and change people's lives. But you got to let them. you got to let them by stepping up, by stepping out. Come on, and God can reset you. God can resurrect you. Come on, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you won't own any of those old things anymore, and you'll be happy. Uh, come on, when you trade everything for Jesus, you're getting a better deal. Mm. 
God already reset the world seven times, the Bible says. He, he reset the game when he wasn't getting his way. Amen. God had to change his covenant, his, his relationship, his agreement with man. There are seven dispensations or there are seven times that God changed his relationship with mankind. He changed his covenant with man seven times because he had to change his agreement that he had made with his people over and over and over again because of sin. How many people know that seven is God's perfect number? God was fighting with mankind, but he was always in control. And he always had a plan. He's going to have to change it again very soon. Just one more time. Just one more great reset, the Bible says, and then there will be no more crying, no more dying, and that's when he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Hallelujah. And every believer's looking forward to that day. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to it. The longer I live for God, as I'm just, I'm saying, I know we got to do a work before you come. And I, I know there's people still coming. And, and God, I'm desperate for revival. But I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Brother Baxter is a powerful preacher in our organization who went on to be with the Lord during COVID. And he had a phenomenal revelation of eschatology and end time events. And, and we've got a lot of teaching about that that we're going to go into in November. But I was talking to Jordan uh, this morning about it, and I said, maybe God just took Brother Baxter because he knew everything that was going to happen, what was going on. He would have told us all, and we would have had to. God wanted it to be by faith that we trust him during all of this that's going on. You see, I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to that day, and what a day, glorious day that's going to be. And I'm looking forward to that day. But God's going to have to shake us up to wake us up uh, if he's ever going to take us up. You feel like everything's going wrong in your life or you're having all kinds of struggle. It's for your good. God's going to have to shake us up to wake us up if he's ever going to take us up. If we're going to make the rapture, if we're going to rise with a shout when the last trumpet sounds, when the last blast of the shofar sounds in this grace dispensation and the final opportunity for this generation to be saved has passed, it'll be too late. So we should take advantage now as not to neglect so great a salvation provided to us by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that by his blood, the Bible says, we have the forgiveness of sins when we obey the gospel. I thought you guys would get more excited about that. It's all about the gospel. Because sometimes God just has to shake things up to get our attention. I know God's been shaking things up around here right now. God's been shaking things up around the church. I'm aware of that. I told Brother Rob this morning, as a pastor, I just go and put my head in the sand. Do you got the victory yet? No? Okay. Is your trial over yet? No. And I just pray. I just stick my head in the sand and I pray. And I'm just like in my bunker and I'm waiting for God to finish doing what he's doing because I know God's working. I know God's working through what we go through. And I love people and I encourage them and I'm here with you. And there's nothing more uh, uh, beneficial for you in your walk with God than having a pastor who's praying for you when you're going through what you're going through. And having brothers and sisters in Christ praying for you. Because sometimes talking about it makes it worse. Sometimes complaining about it, we want to vent. We're just giving place to the devil. Sometimes it's just hold your peace. Live for God. You see, sometimes God has to shake things up to get our attention. And I know God's been shaking things up around here, but it's for our good. It's the way we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Everybody wants it to be just waving a magic wand and your life gets changed 
and then all of a sudden you're walking on streets of gold. But the truth is, there's a testing. There's a faith necessary. There's a walking. It's a marathon. It's not a 100-meter dash. It's a process. You see, but God reset humanity seven times. If we look at those seven dispensations as God's mercy reaching from the beginning of time until now, the end of time, the end of days, Jesus is soon to return. But even more than just seven different dispensations, by God's mercy and by His judgment, God has had to many times shake things up to change everything, to cause a problem, reaction, solution, scenario to get our attention. Problem, reaction, solution to get our attention. Where do you think the devil stole that idea? Come on, after all, there's nothing new under the sun. The devil's playbook is played out. We're going to get ahead of him and what he's doing. We're going to have revival because we know what he's doing. The Bible says we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. I like to say it like this. We ain't ignorant. Come on, we got it figured out. And after all, there's nothing new under the sun from the flood to the Tower of Babel, Babel, into the Promised Land, all the way to the cross, and into the New Testament church, God shook things up to get our attention time and time again. He had to. He shook things up to get us to look up. And I want to encourage someone today to look up because your, your redemption is drawing near. Come on, today is the day of salvation. And tomorrow is not promised. Today is the day for a great reset. A God reset. Where all things can become new. Come what may, whatever comes to pass. In the closing moments of this dispensation, God has given you time. Come on, God will give you hope and peace and a new life. All things can become new today if we just yield to what God wants to do in us and through us before he returns. Come on, why don't you reset your commitment today? Reset your heart on the things of God. Reset your spiritual compass. Recalibrate your GPS to make sure you're heaven bound. There's something to be said about going through the maze and the labyrinth of life and we get busy, we get tired, we get all kinds of excuses that shift our priorities of what's supposed to be due north on our compass. It should always be Jesus and the cross and sacrifice and faithfulness. Come on, and commitment. There's something to be said about just going With the flow, any dead fish can float down a stream, but it takes a live one to fight the current. And that's how the salmon, that's how the salmon spawn, that's how they are reborn. And it's going to take some fighting against the culture to be countercultural. If we're going to be saved, it's not just going to be a ticket that you get, a golden ticket to get into heaven. There's something to be said about enduring until the end. The same shall be saved. Everybody say, Great reset. The all, let's all stand. With the music come back, I just I really want you to pick up what I'm laying down. It's a simple principle that while the whole world is changing all around us, going in an antichrist direction, going in a beast system direction, God is resetting the church. God's resetting hearts. God's resetting, come on, the timetable. Everybody keeps saying, how close are we to the second coming of Jesus? How close are we to the tribulation? How close are we? No man knows the day or the hour. But I promise you this. If you've got a watch and there's, you know, that time and date thing, I don't know what it's called, where you gotta re- you got to set your watch all the time. I've had a watch where I left it in a drawer and when I put it on, it's not telling the same time anymore because the battery's dying. Maybe it's because I never bothered resetting it when there was the, um, 
what is it? Spring, you spring ahead. Fall, you fall behind. Daylight savings time. But when I pick up that watch, it's a mess. It's not even close to the right time. And I got to reset it. Maybe I got to change the battery. But I'm a watch guy. I, I, like, I like watches. And, and it's something about just knowing how much time you've got left on planet Earth. Every second matters. You can't get it back. And maybe somebody here needs to reset your commitment, your walk with God. Maybe you've just let, you've let things slide and you, every time you look at your watch, you're falling behind. You want to be in the place where you know God speaks to me. I'm faithful to his church. I serve. I, I give. I, I support. I'm involved. Because I know midnight hour is coming. Jesus is going to crack the sky. He, I want him to catch me doing my father's business. If you're struggling right now with sin or with doubt, with fear or with despair, that's good. Because I just preach that God shakes us up to wake us up before he takes us up. And that's his promise to never leave us nor forsake us and to help us to overcome sin by his amazing grace. And before that great and terrible day, no man knows the day or the hour that the Son of Man shall come in the clouds with great glory, with a great reset. You see, it's going to be great for some people and it's going to be terrible for other people. Will you be ready? Church, by death or rapture, I want to make heaven my home. Come on, I want to open this altar today, and I want you to take this moment seriously. Can you come to the altar today and pray with me that together we can make it? And to make up if there's been offenses.